All right, Howard Rock Collection, how are we doing this morning? All right, all right. It's good to see everybody. My name is Andy Clark. I'm one of the pastors at the church. Hope you're having a great morning, and, a, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, glad you're here because we are in a message series called A Journey to the Promised Land, okay? And what we're doing is we're looking at, at the Israelites' journey from Egypt to the Promised Land, and we're seeing how that relates to our lives today. So last week, I kicked it off. And we looked at their, their, their exodus, what was called the exodus, where they left Egypt and God took them into the wilderness. And eventually they came upon the Red Sea and God parted the Red Sea so they could walk through the middle of it on their freedom walk. All right. And so we've seen how that relates to our lives because we can become captives to things as well. All kinds of things in our lives, emotions, situations, whatever. But, you know, God wants us to be free. So he's there with us. But we have to move with him. And eventually we're going to come across a big obstacle that stands in our way, stops us in our path. But God's going to create a path for us to walk through there, right? But we have to walk through the path too. All right, so that's where we left off last time. We left off where they had just went through the Red Sea. So I want to revisit some scripture today to tell the promise of God. And then we're going to pick up where, they, uh, where we left off last week. So if we look at Exodus chapter 3. All right, we're going to be mainly in the book of Exodus today. Exodus is the second book in the whole Bible. And it's in the Old Testament, all right? And so we see Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, and we learned this last week. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that good land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I revisit that because... We see that God promises, look, I have a better plan in store for you, right? I have a better plan. I'm going to rescue you. But not only that, I have a great land in store as a land flowing with milk and honey. All right, so he says, I'm going to bring you out here to a land flowing with milk and honey. So we're going to pick up today in Exodus 15. All right, so they're on the other side of the Red Sea. And we're going to start in verses 22 and read through 25. It says, then Moses, <coughs> excuse me, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the, the desert of Shur. For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, the, uh, they could not drink because its water was bitter. That is why they called the place Marah, which means bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. Now, in the ESV version, uh, it says the water became sweet. And when you look up the words, and you know, it means uh, the water became sweet. So it's like, hold on a second. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Right. Uh, we left Egypt. and We're supposed to be going into a land of milk and honey. But instead, they leave and they go into another wilderness. And now the water's bitter there. So it's kind of like, hey, what's going on? That's why today's message is entitled, what? No honey. Right? They're supposed to be going to the land of milk and honey. It's like, what? No honey. I mean, come on, God. I had these, I had these dreams with this milk and honey, you know, like these, these milk waterfalls. And I was going to take my little Oreo cookies, you know, and I'm going to sit there and dip them in the waterfall and eat at the same time with the milk falling on me. I had these dreams about these honey lakes, and we were going to go swimming in the honey lakes and probably not move around too much and then come out and get attacked by bees. But, I mean, hey, for the time, right, like this milk and honey, I'm really looking forward to to this milk and honey, God. But then he gives them this insight on why they're there. So as we continue, verse 25 and then 26, there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on you on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So he gives us some insight. Okay, you're not there yet because I'm going to start teaching you some instructions, right? I have some commands. I have some de de decrees. I need you to be able to listen to me. And I love how God's honest about this, right? He's just like, hey, look, you know, this is the reason why you're here, okay? He's not sugarcoating anything. He's not, he's not giving them a big facade that everything's going to be fine and, and glitz and glamour, right? He's just like, look. There's some things that we need to go through first before we get to the promised land. I love how he's honest about it. But then he gives them this encouragement in verse 27. Then they came to Elim, 
where the, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. So after he gives them the insight, then he gives them that encouragement. He's like, okay, all right, look, here's some water. Here's some nice palm trees, almost like a postcard. That's what I'm getting out of this. You know, it's like you look at a postcard. It's like this beautiful scene with all these palm trees and water. I'm sure that's probably what it looked like. So I love it because God's showing them, for one thing, okay, we're going on a journey. But this journey, it's not going to be all bad, okay? It's not going to be all bad. It's not going to be all good. There's going to be ups and downs in this thing. And also he's showing them, I have what you need. I have what you need. You want some water? You're crying out because you want some water? Here you go. Here's some Here's all kinds of water for you. So God showed them from the get-go that it's not going to be all good and all bad, and also that he has exactly what they need. But this Israel doubting God and, and going back and forth, this wasn't a one-time thing. In fact, this just continues to go on. And so I want to look at the next few situations that they have with God, and then we'll start applying it to our life. So as we go up to Exodus 16, uh, verses 2 through 4, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So God does this big thing for them, okay, and then they're walking along for however many days, and, and all of a sudden they need something again from God. So now they start grumbling and complaining again. And now they're saying, oh, now we had meat pots in Egypt, right? Well, I'm going back to Egypt now. At least we had some meat pots, right? At least we had something to eat and something to drink. So now they're looking back at Egypt, and now they're glorifying it. You know what? Men are taking like to another level. Okay, God, well, I'm leaving. I'm going back to the same situation I was just in. I mean, at least we have food. I mean, forget about the fact that it was a harsh, you know, slavery. They were being punished. They had no freedom. They had to make bricks from straw. I mean, they forgot all about all this other nasty stuff, and they're, lo they're looking at this one little thing and saying, okay, God, I don't have that, so I'm going back. This is God's solution. Uh, verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day, and this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. <clears throat> and so he, he, uh, this bread was called manna, okay? And it means, what is it? They didn't really know what it was. It came down with the dew in the morning. It was white. Uh, it tasted like honey a little bit. And uh, so it was this bread from heaven that God provided for them. So then they travel some more, okay? And they're pretty good for a little while. Then they travel some more. And then they're thirsty. So they say the same thing. Oh, God, where Moses, Aaron, God, come on, man, where's the water at, right? They start complaining about that stuff. And so in 17, we skip up to 17 and look at verses 6 through 7. He says, I will stand there before you at the rock of Horeb. All right, this is God speaking to Moses. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa, which means temptation, and Meriva, which means contention, because the Israelites quarreled against, quarreled, and they tested the Lord, saying, "Is the Lord among us or not?" So there we go. They're walking again, right? They're complaining. Now they're taking it to a whole nother level. God is not providing what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. So now it means God's not even here anymore. God, where are you at? Are you even here anymore? See, so it seems to be spiraling downward. And so this situation here, right, this is actually a common theme in the wilderness for the Israelites with God. They, they uh, you know, they need something. They feel like they don't have something. They want God to do something for them. And so they, you know, they complain and they quarrel with God and they put him to the test. They do all these things. And so God does this great miracle. He provides for them. And then, and then they're good with God for a little while. And then all of a sudden they kind of walk some more. And then, all, you know, then they need something else. They don't have what they want. God's not doing something, and so then they complain against him. God provides, and it's just this common cycle that keeps continuing in the wilderness. Uh, in the wilderness. So it's not surprising that this happens. So eventually they make it to the promised land, all right? And they're looking at the promised land. They send 12 spies in to go look at this land called Canaan, the promised land. And they go to the promised land, and they see that this land is awesome. 
I mean, it has more than just milk and honey in it. It's got pomegranates. It's got food. It's got meat. It's got cattle. It's got streams. It's got fish. It's got all these great things. It's got everything that they need, but it also has giants living in there. All right, so they go back and they report back to Moses and a few people, and they say, man, this land is awesome, but there's giants living there, and there's two people. Uh, Joshua and Caleb, and they say, man, we can take these guys, man. These guys are nothing. We'll go in there. We'll take possession of this land. But everybody else is like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't think we can do it. So God says, you know what? We're not going in. We're not going in. It's almost like I can imagine, like, you know how parents go on a trip with the kids, and they keep complaining, and they say, I'm going to turn this thing around. You know, <laughs> you keep going, man. I'm going to turn this thing around. That's what God did. God said, okay, we're turning, around. we're turning this thing around. We're not going to Disneyland, right? We're going to go to, a, to, a, to a, a theme park or play or something. You know, we're not going to Disneyland here. So, so that's just it. And see, they were forgetting a few things. For one, I pointed out last week, as soon as they started leaving Egypt, Moses turned around and he said, commemorate this day. Remember what God is about to do for you. And so... And then he said, when you get to the promised land. So they haven't even left the promised land yet, and God's already talking about being there. See, they're, commemor- they're not commemorating. I mean, here they are. God just did this great thing. He parted the Red Sea. There were walls of water on each side, something that no man could ever do. They parted the Red Sea, and so they walked through it, and then three days later, they're complaining about a glass of water. God, can you not give us water? And then they're commemorating Egypt. Oh, at least we have food there. And he said, when you take possession, he kept saying this, when you take possession of this land, when you take possession. So then they go and they look at the promised land and they see giants and they go, oh, we can't take possession. God's already said, when you take possession, I will go in there. I will fight for you, right? I'm there every step of the way. You just need to go and you need to take possession of this thing. So see, they're forgetting all these things. They don't have the faith. They don't have the trust, right? They don't have all these aspects that they need to learn, not not only to get to the promised land, but also to be able to sustain themselves while they are in the promised land. And so that's why God says, look, we need to go back. So this journey that should have taken right around two weeks takes 40 years. They wandered around in the desert for 40 years. He might ask, why, right? I mean, why would God do that to begin with? I mean, why didn't they go straight into the land of milk and honey, right? Like, why didn't they just go straight into that land? Well, it's because they did not have the aspects that they needed to learn to go into the promised land as well. Some people might be inclined to say, well, you know, if I was there, I would have listened to God. I would have trusted him. I would have took possession of that thing. I would have remembered all this stuff. I would have did all this. But see, I think we can relate to them more than what we think that we can. Because, yeah, see, we go on this journey with God, right? Yeah, so we have, we have this problem. We have these situations that we are held in captivity to. And so God says, I want you to be free, right? I want you to go on this freedom walk with me. So we say, okay, God, and we do, right? So we leave Egypt. We go into the wilderness. We hit that big obstacle, and God does this miracle. He puts a path straight through it, and so we go with him, okay? So we go with him. We go through the path. And then we might be inclined to say, man, I'm glad that was over. I'll never have to go through anything like that again. It's smooth sailing from here, right? I believe in Jesus. I've been told that everything's going to be good and okay and everything's going to be fine. So here we go. I'm I'm walking with God and everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to go fine. And then we start getting a little bit of something happen or maybe we don't have what we think we should. And then we start doubting God. We start questioning. We start to question ourselves. Wow, am I am I doing the right thing? I mean, am I in the right place? Did did I do something wrong? I mean, God, I mean, you know, where are you at? I mean, I, I think I'm just going to go back. I mean, it may not have been all, all fun for me, but at least at times I knew what I was provided for. At least at times my stomach was full a little bit, right? At least at times I thought everything was okay. So here I am in the wilderness with you, and I'm all confused and doubting, so I think I'm just going to go back. And so God does this great miracle. He does something in our lives to show he's there. And we go, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm on the right track. We're good, God. We're good. We're good, God. And then we walk a little bit longer, and then 
maybe we don't have what we need or God doesn't do it what we want him to do or something goes wrong. We go, okay, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, God, hang on a second. Are you even here? Like, like here I am. I'm trying to do this thing. Are you even here? And God does this great, awesome thing, provides for us, does whatever we need to do to show he's there, and then we're good again. Okay, God, whoo, never mind. Got you, God. We're good. And we walk a little bit more, and we just continue on this same old cycle. So honestly, if you can relate with this today, if you feel like that, you're in the right place, honestly. You're on a journey with God. Most likely, you're just in the wilderness, and God is trying to teach us something. Right now, it's time to learn. Now it's time to grow. We have to realize one thing that this is not going to be an overnight transformation. Okay, now whenever we come to Christ, we are made new. Right, we are new creations. We are made whole. We're we're good. But but a lot of times, parts of our lives, parts of ourselves, right, parts of our attitudes, they are far from where God needs them to be. And so we go on this journey. We go on this process of transformation with God. And it's not a lot of times. It's not an overnight matter. So we talked about last week about things that hold us in, right? Things that we're trying to fight against, things we're trying to get out of. We're trying to get to that promised land. We talked about addictions. Talked about being in debt. Talked about bitterness or spiritual things or like relationships, marriages or being single, right? Grief, all of these things like we want to go on this journey with God, but we want everything to be better now. You know, like with addiction. Okay, I haven't. I haven't played out my addiction in two weeks. I mean, here we go. Why doesn't my family trust me? My family's supposed to trust me now. And, I mean, everybody's supposed to like me. You're supposed to be congratulate me. And now I'm back, so I'm the head of the family. Here I am. Here I am. And, oh, oh, wait a minute, God, I have no credit, and I spent all my money. So uh, um, um, I need two jobs, God. I need two jobs right now. I'm going to work all this, okay? So I, I need this to happen for me right now. Okay, I'm climbing out of debt, man. All right, so I made my minimal payments on my credit card, and uh, and I stopped eating out every night. So 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 where's all the money at, God? Why not? You know, why isn't all the money raking in? Also, why isn't my credit score up 50 points already? I need to I need to get a new loan. I need to get a new loan, God. Man, our marriage. I mean, I haven't yelled in like two weeks, or I haven't, you know, I haven't, you know, provoked them in two weeks, or I haven't done all these things that he wants me to do. Why isn't my marriage perfect? Our marriage is supposed to be perfect now, God. God, I'm single in Christ, and I'm trying to live the same way, and I got out of that bad relationship. Where's my spouse? Like, I'm supposed to walk out the door. My spouse is supposed to be right there, God. God, I've forgiven that person. I really have. I have gave it to you, and I forgave them. Why do I still feel those emotions? I'm, I'm, supposed to be, I'm supposed to be free right now, God. See, so we go, we go on this journey with God, and we make the first steps, which are huge, but, it's, but we find that we're not straight into the land of milk and honey. We, we say the same thing. What? No honey? So, yeah, like I said, it's awesome. We've, take some, we've taken some first few steps. But if we want to be to the promised land, then we have to go on a journey, right? Not only to get to the promised land, but we have to go on a journey to learn how to sustain the promised land as well. So some people might say, well, that's not fair, right? Nobody ever told me that. I thought everything was going to be better. There's well, a little problem with that statement. One is our idea of better and his idea of better are two different things, right? My idea of better is the fact that the consequences are gone and the pain's gone and I can walk around okay. But God's idea of better is that I've been transformed through this and now I can help grow and shape other people. Another thing is, is nobody ever told it was going to get better, right? If you heard that on the internet by somebody, you need to find somebody else to listen to, okay? Because somebody says, oh, you know, you believe in Jesus Christ and everything's going to be better. It's all going to be great. God doesn't say that. In fact, he says, the world hated you. Oh, the world hated me, the world's going to hate you too, right? He says, when you are persecuted. First Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trials that you are facing, right? God says, look, being a Christian isn't always going to be easy, but it is always worth it. So, yeah, there is a, there is a process. There's, there's more to learn in these things. Like for addictions, yeah, sure. 
we have put down the addiction for two weeks. That is great. That is awesome, right? That is a huge step. That is a big, big deal. But if we want that promised land, if we want to get there, then it's time to learn. It's time to grow, right? What is causing that? What is causing that for me? It's time to learn how not to be so selfish, right? It's time to learn how to live without it. It's time to learn and grow in our addictions. That way, if we do get what we want, we don't ruin it. Okay, so we stop buying things that we can't afford, right? We start making minimal payments. That is great. That is a great way to get out of debt, and that is awesome. Those are huge steps. But now it's time to learn to be content with what we have. Now it's time to learn how to start giving more. Because before money was all about me and what I can get with it. Now you want to get loose from the bonds of money, give it away. Start giving it away. Now it's time to have good monetary financial priorities. It's time to have a budget. Okay, we've forgiven that person. That's awesome. Now it's time for one to forgive ourselves. Next, it's time to start using that energy that's there, that, that emotion that's there. Start doing positive things with it, right? Start doing positive things with that energy, with that emotion that's still there. Sure, in marriage, okay, we start learning a few little things, you know, that are blocking our good marriage. That's fine. So now we've taken those steps. Those are big. Those are huge. Now it's time to to be mindful of those things. Now it's time to consider our spouse. Now it's time to love our spouse. Now it's time to die for ourselves, right? There is a process in order to have this. You're single in Christ. Awesome. Now it's time to learn aspects about yourself that might run off the spouse, right? Because we have things like God is trying to teach us things within ourselves that are going to inhibit the marriage. See, there's a process to these things. There, there are a lot of these things that we need to go through a process yet. So these are teachings from the wilderness. These are reasons why we're in the wilderness to be able to learn and grow with God. So when I look at the teachings of the wilderness through the Bible, there's so many of them. There really are. You could go online. You can look them up. Uh, there's a lot, but there's a few I want to point out today that I notice are happening in the wilderness with God. Because whenever... Uh, you know, like I said, whenever we get to the promised land, we want to make sure we've learned these things so that way we can stay there as well. So the first one is this. Find Jesus in everything. Find Jesus in everything. We have to learn to go to Jesus first to be our solution, right? Because it's his promised land. It's his way. The building relationship with God is absolute number one. The main problem the Israelites had in Egypt, it wasn't the fact that they were in that situation. It was the fact that their relationship with God was broken. They didn't have a strong enough relationship with God to be able to get them out of Egypt, right? So God had to make the move first. So the first thing they need to do is realize that God is the solution. That's the same thing with us. If we're going to realize it, if we're going to make it to this promised land and we're going to be able to, to sustain it, the first thing we need to do is be able to go to God first, right? Find His solution because it's not the world's solution. It's God's solution first. And so God was there. When they first left uh, uh, the Red Sea and they, you know, they first encountered those problems. God was right there showing them He was the solution and He was actually showing that Jesus was there as well. Because if you look, at these and what happened, you see Jesus all in them. Like first, the bitter water. They went out there and started drinking the bitter water. And they were like, oh, man. Oh, man, look at that water. I know that water. Man, that water is going to taste sweet. And they started drinking, and it was bitter. And it's the same way with us, right? We're going to go out there, and we're going to say, oh, man, I know that. But, but there's going to be bitter times. So he said, throw a piece of wood in it. And when he threw the piece of wood in it, it made it sweet. The cross is made of wood. Throw a piece of wood in it. See, whenever we get in our, uh, on our path with God and we start running these things, uh, uh, you know, that seem bitter, that don't seem the way we're going through right, and it gets us down, it gets us downhearted, look to the cross, and the cross can make it sweet. Amen. See, the cross can make it sweet because we say, oh, Jesus died on the cross for me. I'm really appreciative. Yeah, you know what? Life isn't always going to go great. My car is going to break down, but Jesus died on the cross for me. Can that make it sweet? 
Sure, yeah, I'm going through tough times right now. I'm going through this learning process, but can I learn to look to the cross and make it sweet? So one of the first things we got to do is find Jesus in everything, where Jesus becomes our solution. The cross is enough. So then they go, and they're hungry. And the problem isn't physical hunger, it's spiritual hunger. That's why they couldn't be fed, because they're not looking to God. They're looking to things of this world to be able to fulfill them. So God says, okay, I'll give you some manna. Here's some bread from heaven. Well, if you read John chapter 6, there's some Israelites, you know, they're questioning Jesus on who he is. And they say, give us a sign. And they say, oh, oh we got manna in the desert as a sign. And Jesus says, I am the manna in the desert, right? I am the bread of life. You come to me, and you will never be hungry again. So once again, he's saying, yeah, that wasn't their solution. I am the solution. I am the spiritual solution. So once again, find Jesus in everything. We have to go to Jesus first. He is the answer from God that we are looking for. Once again, the water from the rock. They were thirsty. So God says, strike it with your staff and water will come out of the rock. Okay, well, Jesus in John chapter 7 says that the Holy Spirit will be liver, uh, rivers of living water flowing from within them, talking about us as believers. So he's saying that there's rivers of living water. Well, Jesus is the solid rock of our salvation, and the Holy Spirit is flowing from Jesus. We only get the Holy Spirit through salvation in Jesus. So yes, if you think you're thirsty, we're not thirsty for physical water. We're thirsty for spiritual water. So he's saying look to Jesus, and he will give you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will fill you up. See, so the first three things that we learn in the desert, in the wilderness from God is the cross is enough, Jesus will feed you, and the Holy Spirit will help you. So if we're going to get to this promised land and sustain it, the first thing we need to do is be able to find Jesus in it all. And then from there, realize this. Situations do not control our relationship with God. That's what was happening with them. As long as everything was going good, as long as God provided for them, as long as they got what they needed, as long as their appetites were full, they were okay with God. Their relationship with God was on the top. But as soon as things started going south, they didn't understand something, they felt like they needed something, their relationship with God was going, went away. So their relationship with God went like up and down all the time, depending on the cir outside circumstances. Okay? And true, we're not always going to have a, on top relationship with God, right? We're human. We're going to have times of doubt and, and, and faithlessness, right? We're going to have times where our relationship with God subsides. We're not going to read our Bible every day, right? We're not going to pray all the time. So that's going to happen, but it shouldn't happen that often, really. You know, especially when things start going south. If every time something starts going wrong, we're looking at God going, God, what's going on? I don't understand. And we stop seeking and we pitch a temper tantrum, really, then we need to see that, if we're going to make it to the promised land and be able to sustain ourselves in the promised land, we have to be able to build our relationship with God, no matter what's going on on the outside. Whether we're on the valley or on the mountaintop, our relationship with God should stay the same. Should stay the same. Because think about it. The number one problem is their relationship with God was broken, so therefore the number one solution to everything should be our relationship with God. That should be our number one goal, is our relationship. Because our relationship with God is what sustains us all the time. And third discipline discipline us and this is a huge huge thing because this word discipline means a whole lot of things for one thing it doesn't mean punishment right we hear discipline and we think punishment discipline in the bible means to train okay the same way like think about discipline not as punishment think about it as like martial arts right you are disciplined by a certain di di uh you know martial art type and so you're disciplined you're trained by it Okay, it's the same way. You go to school. You're trained to go to school. We, we're supposed to train our children, right? We're supposed to discipline our children. So we are to be trained by this. It, 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 this is what we're supposed to do because we, we have to be trained by God in order to sustain the promised land. And the number one thing to be trained by God is to listen to what he has to say. God needs to know that we can follow directions. He needs to know that we can follow instructions to, to sustain the promised land. And and God, like, this whole thing about 
hearing his commands and his decrees and his rules and his statutes and being able to hear and listen. This is all through the first five books of the Bible, right? This is all through the wilderness. In fact, listen how many times, just in two chapters in Deuteronomy, chapters 10 and 11, or the beginning of 12, listen how many times, 10, 9. And to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I command in you for your good today. 11.1, 1, you shall therefore love the Lord your God, keep his charts, his statutes, his rules, his commandment always. Verse 8, you shall, keep, you shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you to do today. Verse 13, if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today. Verse 22, for if you are careful to do all this I command and command to you to do today. Verse 26, see I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. 12.1, these are the statutes and rules that you are to be careful to do in the land the Lord your God promises you. God is a God of words, okay? He, he, he says things for a reason. I mean, think about it. God knows every language on the earth. He knows languages of civilizations that have passed that we have no idea they even existed. He knows angelic languages, words we'll never even fathom or can't even comprehend, right? So God knows languages, all these different languages. When God says the same thing over and over again in such a short time, he is trying to drive a point home we have to learn the rules the commandments the statutes the decrees of the lord our god if we're going to get to these promised lands if we're going to stay in these promised lands we have to do it god's way and i think that's where a lot of people get off the path and return to egypt because we want to do things our way we have to be humble and listen to god and do things his way And this is big time. It's called developing Christian character. Our character is huge, especially in sustaining the promised land. I mean, think about it. Say we are an addict and say our, our you're single, right? And say we do get a family, okay? Well, if we haven't worked on our character defects, right, if we haven't worked on our anger issues or our trust issues or we haven't worked on any of this, say we do get the family, and then we run them off. Now we're even in a worse position than we were before because now whatever trust we did have from them, now that's squashed because we didn't develop Christian character. Say we do, uh, you know, pay off some debt. What if God did give us all that credit and all the credit cards and all the stuff, all the loans that we're wanting to get some more of. We haven't learned any disciplined financial habits. We haven't learned how to pay anything off. So now that money just put us in a worse spot than we were before. Say our marriage. Yeah, I mean, you know, say our marriage. Say we do, you know, learn a few things. We have to develop Christian character. And this is what all this is about, being able to develop ourselves to learn and grow to be able to get to the promised land and be able to sustain the promised land. So, yes, we go on this great journey with God, right? God wants us to be free. He wants, to, he wants these things for us. He wants us to leave Egypt. He wants us to go through the Red Sea to trust him to walk through these things. So he does. He takes us into a wilderness. And in this wilderness, though, think about it. It's so great, man. For one thing, we get to see God at work in our lives, right? But this is where... This is where we develop as an individual. This is where we learn and grow, right? This is where we begin to trust God. This is where we have to start learning aspects of ourselves to be able to deny so that way we can get to the promised land, not only get there, but also to be able to sustain it as well. And sure, there's going to be tough times, right? We live on planet Earth, but it's not going to be all bad either. It's, you know, there's going to be times of, of the postcard episode, you know, where we have these great journey with God and we get to rest and we get to drink from the cool and we get to sit in the shade. But then eventually it's, a, it's another point in our journey, right? Then eventually it's time to get back to work. But if we can take these moments and we can look for Jesus for every, in everything, right? We can go to God for our solution. We can look to him first and we can build that relationship no matter what. We can stay with God in that relationship and then say, God, Teach me. Train me. Right? Yes, God, show me what it is I need to learn so I can get out of this. Because the thing about it is, they went back to the, to the wilderness, and, and they went around in circles for 40 years until they learned what they need to learn. It's the same way with us. We can go around in circles for years and years and years until we learn what it is we're supposed to learn. 
Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, right? He loves us all the time. And it doesn't mean we're not going to receive the promised land in other areas of our lives, right? We'll make leaps and bounds in some areas, and some we're just going to continue to circle in. And we may never get out of it our whole life if we do not learn what we're supposed to learn and trust God and go. And go. But God is awesome. He's there with us every step of the way. Remember, God wants us to have this promised land more than we do, right? And he already said, when you get there, it's already there. It's already there. But it can be tough. It can be tough. And so I want to leave us off with this encouragement today. Deuteronomy 11, 10 through 12. The land that you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as in a vegetable garden. But the land that you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It is a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continuously on it from the beginning to the end of the year. Remember, this promised land is awesome. Drinking rain from heaven. God is continuously on it. He is there. We already know what Egypt holds. Right, We already know what Egypt holds. It holds an empty promise. Egypt will promise, captivity will promise all these things. It will never deliver, and it just goes down and down and down like there is no hope there. But, yeah, we may have to enter a wilderness to be able to get there, but remember the wilderness holds a promised land. It holds that land where we are free, where we are good, right, where we do have the things that we want. God wants you to have a good marriage. God wants us to be financially free. God wants us to not be slave to addictions, right? God wants us to be able to forgive people and invest our energy. Don't, so, so God wants you there, but there's a learning process to go through. Do not, do not deny yourself the promised land in order not to have to learn a few things about yourself. Because then the end result, it's better. It's better. And I'm, I'm there too, right? I'm on my journey. I'm in the wilderness on some areas of my life. I'm in the promised land. I'm, I'm sitting pretty in some areas. In some areas, I'm wondering, man. And God's like, how long are you going to go around in circles, man? <laughs> right? How long? So I'm there. So my challenge today is let's learn, man. Let's quit wandering, right? Let's quit going around in circles. That, yeah, man, let's, uh, you know, let's give it up today. Let's surrender. Okay, God, what do you want me to learn, right? What is it you want me to learn? What do I need to trust you in? What are my next steps? So if that's you today, I, I'm going to pray for us, man. I'm going to pray for us that we can learn, that we can grow together, and we can receive this promised land and, and, and move out of the wilderness. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you how you are awesome. God, I thank you how you are for us all the time, God. You're always for us. I mean, you want this more than we do, God. I mean, you try and try and try. And God, we give up so easy. But you know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So God, I thank you for your love. And God, part of your love is discipline. God, part of your love is training us is teaching us your ways because you know that if we do not learn your ways, then we can send away blessings. And that's not what you want, God. You want a, a promised life. God, you want an abundant life. You want us to know your love, to have healthy families, God, to have, you know, to be free so many ways, addictions, God, debt, whatever it is, Lord, you don't want us to have distress, God. You want us to know peace that, you know, beyond understanding. So, God, I thank you on how you care for us more than we care about ourselves. So, God, today I know I'm wandering around in a desert. And I'm pretty sure there's some people in here doing the same thing. So, God, today, teach us what we need to know. Teach us what will get us out of this wilderness, Lord. Teach us what will push us through to this promised land, God, this, this, this land that we dream of, God, this milk and honey, God. Show us what we need to learn about ourselves to move us to the next part of our journey, God. God, I know we're struggling, God. I know we're struggling. But we trust you, and we believe you today. Show us your way. Let us know what the next step is, God. 
And I thank you that you're faithful enough to do that. So God, as we worship today, let us deny everything in our minds. Nothing else exists but you. You are the only thing. And so God, while we worship you, while we open our hearts to you, while we open our minds to you, give us our solutions, God. And God, if we need to, let us come up here and cry on the altar. God, let us plead to you today. The altar is open if anyone wants to come up here. But God, most of all, let us know your love. Let the cross be sweet in all areas of our lives. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. And it's in Jesus Christ's holy name that we pray.